Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of Red Embrace Hollywood. The plot is getting tight and the weather today is perfect for this game. It's November, it's raining cats and dogs, and we also had a thunderstorm today out of a sudden. So with this atmosphere outside and with a similar one in my heart, let's go. Ring, ring. The phone interrupted my thoughts, snapping me back to the moment. I reached over to pick it up, but as soon as I held the receiver to my ear... Vince? Charisse's voice hissed out at me. I am coming up to your room now. Wait, what? The line abruptly went dead. Oh my god! The she sounded much, much angrier than I'd ever heard her before. Apparently my peaceful night wasn't destined to last very long. Does she know I'm plotting against her with people? <laughs> Probably. Oh dear. A few minutes later, my door rattled with three vehement knocks. Oopsie. The second I opened it, Sherry strode past me, silently storming her way inside my room. She radiated fury, even though her expression looked dangerously calm. <laughs> no, we're not going this way. What happened, Sherry? Sherry's gave me a silent, bitter look. I had a feeling that anger wasn't the only emotion swirling inside her right now. Two of my... Two of my agents were killed tonight. Oh! So it's not me... Okay, that, that's good, but that's also bad. But it's good. When she finally managed to speak, her voice trembled slightly. Not from spying, not from venturing into enemy territory. They were off duty. They hadn't even left Hollywood, but they were picked off, attacked in an alleyway as they... As they left to see a movie together. I'm sorry, Charisse. Apologies won't bring them back from the dead. She scolded at me harshly as if I were somehow responsible for what had happened. These little ambushes, these pathetic attempts at power plays, they're nothing more than a, than a show, a pitiful show of strength they don't even have. One of her hands clenched into a tight fist, knuckles nearly bursting open her globe. Neither the Mavar nor the Golgotha are bold enough to make a genuine first move. They're too afraid of a real conflict. That is why I will make the first move, and an opportunity has just arisen for it. Um... Cherise took a long deep breath, lifting a hand to adjust her glasses. When her steely gaze refocused on me, it seemed like she'd calmed down a little. I am currently working with a new scary manager at the Apotoir to plan a party on Friday, a party exclusive to our coven. The club is considered the most important neutral territory because it is an extremely popular feeding ground. Since the war started, no aggressions have been made on neutral territory, with the exception of the brief escalation in Saturnalia. During the gathering, you're going to announce that the club now belongs to the Iscari, as does the whole city. Me? Why me? Anyone who remains an enemy to our faction will be treated accordingly. Hold on a second, why do you want me to announce this? Your reputation has made you an important figure, an object of keen scrutiny by all of the city's vampires. You are, like it or not, being viewed by many as the political pulse of the city. Many question your allegiances, and now is the time to show once and for all where your loyalty lies. She gave me a long look, determined but not without a faint hint of mistrust. I'll send along my agents, who will provide support both inside and out of the club. There may not be any initial firing, but we should be prepared. Then after that night, you'll forcibly drive them out? Yes, anyone who continues to undermine the city's laws, which worked excellently until the senseless rebellion, will be told to leave Los Angeles. I want to minimize bloodshed, but some of them will inevitably attack us in retaliation. 
What about the human police? They've been sufficiently informed and compensated. Any casualties will be reported as mere gang violence. <sighs> what do I do? I don't even know. <laughs> I'm sorry, Charisse, but I can't take part in this. I'm sure you're quite sorry. I'm as sorry as I am to force you into doing it. In case I have to spell it out further, you don't have a choice in the matter, Vince. Muttering those words bitterly, Sherry shook her head. She still seemed different from her normal self, aggressive but uncertain, almost like a wounded animal ready to attack. Sherry, you're making a mistake here. Then pushing past me, she swiftly made her way to the door. Oh, and just so you're aware. You won't be allowed to leave the hotel without my permission. My agents have been instructed to monitor your movements. Fuck. I suggest you do yourself a favor and stay here. Enjoy the room while you still have it. Door slammed behind her, rattling on its hinges. And with that, I was imprisoned in the hotel. Cherie said the party would happen Friday, but today was only Wednesday. I had to deal with being leashed here until there, kept inside my luxury prison. I glanced outside my window where the moon and dark clouds seemed closer than the distant streets below. For once, I didn't feel hungry at all, only isolated. He was probably working at Saturnalia, though once he learned what happened, he'd no doubt show up to see me. At least that. I sank down onto my bed, staring at the wall with a strangely numb sensation. For a moment, I felt the same way I did my first night, all alone in this empty room. It didn't matter that I'd already seen unimaginable things or survived some of the darkest parts of Hollywood. The coming days still felt like the most uncertain I'd ever see ahead of me. Hmm. That's not good. I feel the darkness coming, guys. An arid Thursday night stretched out before my eyes. I sat in the latch of my open window, gazing at the moon over the Hollywood hills. In less than 24 hours, I'd be walking into the abattoir, getting ready to give an announcement that would change the life of every vampire in LA. Until then, Cherise wanted me to stay here, locked up with my thoughts. I could call someone, but I had a feeling the Iskari were monitoring my phone. My only sources of entertainment were the TV and the sparkling city outside my window. As I sat there alone for the first night in a long time, my mind wandered back to my life before all of this ever happened. My life as a human. Back then I was a... Happy and hopeful, always looking forward to the next day. I felt good about life, about the dreams I was pursuing in the future ahead of me. I think it's more tragic when you are happy as a human. <laughs> Almost every day came with a new discoveries to enjoy, as long as I kept my mind open to finding them. I'd struggled with my dark moments now and then, like everyone did, but overall, I always wanted to have a bright outlook on things. My eyes flicked up to meet the reflection in the window pane. I hadn't really thought about those days in a long time, the old human me. Now, I found myself. Missing my old life, it seemed so peaceful looking back. It was almost hard to imagine a time when life could be boring. But back then, there were plenty of mundane moments to break up the excitement, a far cry from the chaotic whirlwind I endured recently. And in those days, the human world was the only one I knew. A world still full of average people, not the dangerous creatures who surrounded me now. That peaceful life, was it gone from my reach forever? A knock at the door interrupted my thoughts. I rose from my chair and strode over to answer it, wondering if an agent fa had finally come to get me. Of course, it's my boy! But instead, I was greeted by a familiar, well-composed smile. Pull him into a hug. Curling my arms around Heath, I hugged him tightly, squeezing us together. 
After a short pause, he gratefully returned my hug, resting his chin against my shoulder. We stayed like that for a little while, embracing each other, sharing a warmth that I could almost feel. I think we should move out of the hallway. The last thing I want is for Marcus to come by and take a shot at us. When he finally pulled back, he gave me a teasing grin, motioning towards my room. I opened the door enough for him to step inside, although he stayed close to me rather than moving to sit. I know it's only been a few days, but I miss you. I couldn't stop thinking about you, not with all this chaos going on and the conflict that we can't avoid any longer. Drifting his fingers through my hair, he flinted in, letting his forehead press lightly to my own. The brief lightheartedness he'd shown was already fading away, his smile sinking gradually into nothing. I'm so worried, Vince. It will be alright, Heath. I know we'll get through it, somehow. Um, you're right. He nodded firmly, grasping onto his scarf. He never has a scarf on himself on the image. Why is it always mentioned? It tilts me so badly. No matter what happens, there's one thing I always cling on to. I know you made the right choice, no matter how difficult it was. He didn't mention Andre by name, maybe from fear that someone was listening in on us, but he was obviously referring to my decision to back him. Even if it all crashes down around us, I'll be able to face it without guilt, without fear, for the sake of the future we're fighting for. You believe in it with all your heart, don't you? I do, yes. There didn't seem to be any tension left in his voice, like you really had found some kind of peace, something to finally cling on to. With a small glimmer in his eyes, he began to slowly close the gap between us. His slender fingers tiptoed up my arms, hands rising to cap my cheeks, then gently smoothing my hair back. As he gazed at me intently, I thought I glimpsed that glassy, distant look on his face, even though he hadn't injected anything. Hmm. I'm going to say... I need to make sure the scene is legal to show on YouTube, okay? <laughs> Just making sure, because these scenes can sometimes get a little bit too hot. Pull him into a kiss. Sliding a hand through his hair, I pressed his face closer to mine. He met me halfway, brushing our lips together, then sealing them with a gentle, longing kiss. The touch of his lips stayed light. Tenderly affectionate, as if he were in no rush to do anything except enjoy my presence. When he finally pulled back, he looked the happiest I'd seen him since that night outside Saturnalia. This will be our last night here, won't it? After what you say tomorrow, we'll have to find somewhere else to stay, like with some friends of ours. Whispered words brimmed with anticipation, but there was a flicker of hesitation in his eyes, as if leaving the hotel wasn't so easy for him after all. But you know, if I'm remembering right, isn't there a movie we still have to watch? <laughs> I thought you'd never ask. Well, I'm asking now, and you're accepting, aren't you? Of course I am. With a light teasing laugh, he moved over to my TV, picking up the neglected videotape. After he set up the movie, we flicked the lights off and curled up together on my bed, nestling cozily under the covers. It felt like the first time I'd done something just for fun in a while, and maybe for that reason alone, I almost forgot where I was. I could tell he was enjoying himself too, a peaceful smile lingering on his lips as he watched the screen. He seemed so warm, so playful, that it almost reminded me of the first night he'd visited my room. But even as we laughed and shared our thoughts, engaged in each other almost more than the movie, the tension never completely vanished. And now, as we spend our last night in this place together, so different from the way we started. I had to wonder if tomorrow wouldn't see everything come to an end. It's so sad. The next night, I woke up with a knot in my stomach. It was a sharp, knowing feeling that wouldn't go away, not even as they climbed out of the bed to get dressed. 
that feeling was worry. Something bad would inevitably happen tonight. I couldn't help from worrying about my fate, the fate of everyone I cared about. Everything was up in the air. When I finally prepared myself physically and mentally, I decided it was time to go. I made my way to the door, stepped outside and... <sighs> left without looking back. I didn't bother glancing over my shoulder. I was done with that room. It had served its purpose and now I was ready to move on. Downstairs in the lobby, Cherie's agents were waiting for me. From their tight-lipped, intense stares, they seemed to feel more anxious than I was. We took several cars to the abattoir, leaving at slightly different intervals in case we were being watched. Nobody spoke up. The few agents sharing my car only whispered a few words to each other. I had my weapons from before still tucked in my jacket, since I was told we'd be able to smuggle in everything we wanted. From the firepower that the agents were packing, it seemed like they expected to use it. Hmm. We pulled up a block away from the abattoir and I followed the agents towards the front entrance. I noticed a few humans trying to get inside the club, only to get swiftly rejected by the bouncers. But as soon as we approached, they let us inside, swinging open the door with a foreboding creak. Oh dear. The moment I entered the club, a different atmosphere swirled around me. Instead of a crowd of mortals, everywhere I looked, there were only vampires. Tension weighed thickly in the air, as cloying and heavy as the pounding music, but it seemed like Charisse's bait had worked. I saw vampires from all three houses crowding the floor, watching each other uneasily even as they drank and danced the night away. Did they have any idea what was going to happen? No one stopped me as I climbed up to the empty stage, walking over to the microphone. As soon as I approached it, though, I felt more and more eyes flicking onto me. Chris's agents were watching me closest of all, probably ready to pounce if I chickened out. Suddenly the music switched off. Everyone started to murmur in confusion, glancing around to see what was happening. Now seemed like a good time to start. Blow the air horn a brother just in case. I'm going to save this game just for the future's sake, because I want to know all the possible endings. Um. Hey, I've got something important to say. My voice boomed back to me over the loudspeakers. All the vampires who weren't looking at me before now stared at me, wide-eyed. Everybody stayed silent, waiting for my next words. All of you know that the abattoir is neutral ground. Silence. Unfortunately, it seems like that's about to change. I could sense countless eyes piercing into me. Right now, it felt like they were all waiting for me to mess up. Starting tonight, this club and the whole city belong to... Andre. Next few seconds felt frozen in time. Nobody moved, as if they were waiting for somebody else to move first. Just as I started to wonder if my microphone had turned off. All hell broke loose. Some of the vampires charged towards me, but another group leaped onto them, shooting and clawing at them. The Iskari weren't the only ones who smuggled in weapons. Another throng of people raced for the exit, showing each other to escape. Oh, this feels good. <laughs> Hunter Skelter, baby, look out! Bodies were already falling to the floor, both dead and alive. Not wanting to be next, I jumped off the stage towards safety. Wait, I see him! He's over there! Get him! Instantly, a pair of furious cries rang out nearby. I could guess who they were talking about. Darting towards the club's emergency exit, I ducked outside. Gunfire shouting and footsteps raced after me. 
Bullets whizzed over my head, drilling into the wall. Down the street, an alley, another alley, back in the street. No matter how fast I ran, they were right behind me. I felt like an animal fleeing for its life, driven by the pure instinct to survive, but I knew from their voices that I was outnumbered. If only I... Oh no, that simply won't do! As I rounded the corner, a group of Golgotha stepped from the shadows. Zhang stood out at the forefront, wearing a white, malicious grin. Oh, the ring do want. I don't know what that means. Let loose, my friends! Next second, everything from ninja stars to throwing axes reeled past my head. Most of the projectiles weren't aimed to kill, but it was more than enough to send my pursuers fleeing, screamed in panic. A few Golgotha chased after them, using up the rest of their bizarre weaponry before pulling out loaded guns. I started the disappearing shapes of my attackers, who looked like the Mavar from the club. A fantastic performance tonight, Vince. Zhang beamed me proudly, offering some enthusiastic applause. I think a standing ovation from the club goers was uh, well deserved, but I suppose the rest of your audience wasn't quite so appreciative. At least you're a man of culture, Zhang. That's awfully kind of you, and rather spot on if I do say so myself. Oh well, as delightful as it'd be to linger around for the fun, I think we'd better get back to the graveyard, don't you? Yes, before we end up there in coffins. I followed Zhang to a regular taxi parked nearby, whose driver was waiting for us patiently. He didn't smell human. I wonder if they'd somehow stolen the car, or if a vampire cabbies were a normal thing in the lie. He was, uh, he was Kane. He was, he was Bloodline's reference, of course! Thanks to his fast driving, we pulled up at the cemetery before long. As soon as we stepped past the towering gates, I noticed a group of vampires in the distance, crowded near the mausoleum. It felt incredibly strange to see so many people here at once. Most of the city's Golgotha had apparently showed up, and there were plenty of new faces I'd never seen before. He was standing with them. As soon as our eyes met, his lips curled in a warm, hugely relieved smile, and he waved at me delightedly. I couldn't talk to him yet, though. There was still someone I had to see. Hello. Welcome to the both of you. When I stopped in front of the mausoleum with Zhang, Andre turned to study us. You have done most admirable work, Vince. It would seem the Mavar and Iskari have retreated to their respective fortresses for now, allowing us to solidify our plans. <sighs> you don't think they will attack us here? I do not. Both Randall and Charisse are aware of how dangerous such an attack might be. Andre shook his head calmly, not seeming remotely troubled by the possibility. However, my systems have informed me that both houses intend to wage an attack tomorrow night, despite their uncertain ground. The Iskari are quite confident they can overwhelm the Mavar, then lay siege on us, while the Mavar are desperate enough to make the final attack before they lose their foothold. His golden eyes drifted past me for a moment, gazing towards the city lights that glittered in the distance. I could tell a plan had already formulated itself in his head. All those gathered are in agreement. We must involve ourselves in tomorrow's conflict to ensure that our advantage is not lost. Andre motioned towards the other Golgotha, who had been watching us attentively this whole time. They stayed silent, as if they were attending a mass. But I saw a few notes when Andre mentioned their decision. There is but one aspect not yet finalized, our method of attack. We have settled on two options, both equally viable. Indeed, the sole deciding factor could be the sense of honor in combat. We may construct an ambush, cloaking our presences for a short while, or alternatively wait for Mavar and Iskari to weaken each other before joining the fray. Um, um, I mean, both seem to be a little bit shady from the owner perspective. 
the most logical would be the second one, but then again, I think that after what I did yesterday, they might actually try to join forces, which will be not that great, so I think the ambush will be better. Then I, I shall arrange one. These carry are more powerful, therefore it would be wise to strike them first. A fine choice, I'm sure it will go over marvelously. Zang offered a supportive snap of his fingers, seeming thrilled about the idea. I'll be staying up tonight with a few daring assistants, I think. We'll funnel some unusual images into our enemy streams, plan a few distractions for tomorrow. You do you, Zack. And I most certainly will, Vince, thank you. With a little cackle, he tipped his hat at me mischievously. With patience and planning, we may well emerge at to, as tomorrow's victors. Andre's gaze, which had never left my face while Zang spoke, grew a little sharper. However, there is one remaining concern. Not all of the city's vampires will be participants in this conflict. Of course, some of the Mavara and Iskari will undoubtedly agree to join our new government after the turning tides of the power become clear. But there will be many others remaining who wish to see our downfall, both yours and my own. He paused for a moment, letting an unpleasant implication of his words sink in. We may engage the centers in combat or drive them out, as well as charging their leaders with their respective war crimes. There is also the option of keeping the remaining vampires under surveillance to prevent future violent activity. What is your opinion on this matter? I would just drive them out. Like, they can they can easily have their own politics going on in different cities. Just like, the city is yours, it's your domain, so I would just drive them out. Andre nodded, still think his head thoughtfully. An interesting choice. I would strongly consider such a course of action. Then there is nothing more to discuss for tonight. All that remains is tomorrow's denouements. The tension flicked from me back to the group of Golgora, and he motioned with one hand around the graveyard. Those of you not guarding the cemetery are free to repose wherever you see fit. There is plenty of space for all within the mausoleums. The less claustrophobic among you may even find the lodgings to be pleasantly agreeable. When Andre finished speaking, soft murmurs filled the night air, and the gathered vampires quickly started to disperse. Some of them shuffled inside the mausoleums, while others roamed among the trees and graves, disappearing through the darkness. Andre and Zank wandered off together down the path, leaving me by myself. Vince! Just as I turned around, the O'Heath came rushing towards me. Vince, I know it'd be alright, but I... After a brief moment, he suddenly stepped closer, his palms moving to cup my cheeks. Before I knew it, his face was right in front of mine, about to cross the distance between us. Listen. His cool lips passionately sealed against my own, pouring out all the relief he couldn't put into words. I pressed back into his embrace, returning all of his long, tender kisses. As my fingers drifted through his feathery hair, I could feel him trembling slightly, his fingers clutching my jacket like he never wanted to let go. I mean, at least he has some kind of a meaning of life now, so, so he doesn't take drugs anymore, because he clings into political side, I don't know. But after a long few moments, he reluctantly pulled back, just enough to smile gently at me, before his gaze slowly fell to his feet. I'm so sorry, Vince. I wasn't able to slip away from Sharice in time, or else I would have been there at the club. And I wanted to be there so badly. Why couldn't you sleep away sooner? I planned an excuse about preparing Citronelli as a safe house, but I wasn't able to talk to Sharice until after you'd already left. She was busy, I think. I don't think she even listens to my excuse, really. She just told me to go do whatever I needed to do. He trailed off, a smile frozen on his lips for several seconds. But someone else told me what you said at the club, the way you faced everyone so bravely. You really superb and drained the end. I'm so proud of you. And the more I think about the future, the more I realize. You mean more to me than anything, much more than myself. You can't think like that, Heath. Put yourself first. I can't go against my feelings or pretend I wouldn't do anything for the person who's done everything for me. More than anything, I just want to make you happy. And once this is over, Vince will be happy.
I promise. Placing a gentle hand on my shoulder, he lifted his head towards the moon, where the pale rays made his skin seem nearly translucent. I think we should find a place to rest before the sun comes up, don't you? After all, tomorrow is going to be a long, long night. But you'll make it through, like you always do. I'm afraid. He loves me. He loves me not. He loves me. He loves me not. The squeaky whisper of a Golgotha beside me tickled my ear. She was sitting against the wall with the rest of us, counting for her rifle magazine with one finger. I'm sure he loves you. <laughs> oh, he does. The girl winked at me as if we were sharing some kind of secret code. I was crowded in a small nook of the road with about a quarter of the attacking group. The rest were stationed further down. The Mavar hideout was down the alley nearby, within hearing distance. We'd be lying in wait for some time, waiting for this guy to show up somewhere. Our presences were cloaked, hidden by the shell of some Golgotha power I didn't really understand. It wouldn't last very long, but long enough for us to catch our opponents off guard, supposedly. Earlier that evening, Andre had assigned me to a group. He seemed confident that I should be involved, and made it clear that there wasn't any room for argument. In the end, I decided to... stay nearby ready to help or negotiate. I didn't intend to involve myself in the fight, but I could still be useful. If anyone needed help or if there was a chance for negotiations, I'd be able to step in. And one of those things had to happen. Okay. I don't know if this is a good idea, but let's see, I'm, I'm a better talker than fighter. Most of the Golgotha had left the graveyard, but a few stayed behind, just in case the Bavar or Iskari planned a surprise attack. He was one of them. He hated the idea of letting me go alone, but Andre persuaded him to stay. All three of us probably knew he didn't belong in the fight, if that night at Saturnalia was any indication. As we waited together in the darkness, no one seemed inclined to say anything. Besides the girl next to me, a few people whispered now and then, but most others seemed weighed down by anticipation. Only the occasional sound of passing traffic broke the silence. Oh. Zang abruptly lifted his head. The next moment I heard the car engine approaching, but instead of passing by, its engine abruptly turned off. Zang and I exchanged glances. I felt something different in the air nearby, but it was hard to place what or where it was. It must have been cloaking the presences too. Marcus is helping them, isn't he? Or maybe he's not. Motioning for us to follow, Zang slipped out of our hidden spot. I followed along with the other Golgotha, bracing myself for whatever was around the corner. But none of us were ready for the Mavar and Iskari to charge at us head on. Within seconds, a cataclysmic fight exploded in front of me. All I could see was gunfire and streaks of blood. Everywhere I looked, corpses were already falling, pools of blood splattering the asphalt, shrieks and howls blended into one constant roar, and the stench of death clogged my senses. Unlike at the clap, no one targeted me, they were just charging the first enemy they saw. The deaths were too fast, blood shattering skulls, claws ripping open throats, brains smashed into the ground, blood splattered my face and my clothes as the carnage around me raged on and on. Help me! Hand weakly grabbed my leg, fingers scrabbling against it. I looked down to see a bumper who charged in with us. But his chest was torn open and through his shattered ribs, I could see an unbeating heart. Put him out of his misery. I reached into my jacket for the spare pistol I brought aiming at his head. Just as I was about to squeeze the trigger, why? Blood dropped from his lips, eyes wide and stupefied as they stared into mine. Why aren't you fighting? I don't believe it. You fought with me. Maybe I have lived. All this his torn body can fingers tearing at his own exposed fat and tissue. Until he suddenly stopped. 
He's still alive as I still fix on my face. The air blends into a cacophony of laughter, roars and screams, gleeful and horrified like suns rising from hell. Some vampires had already given up, turning tail and fleeing for their lives. Others were trying to claw their way into safety, only to get cut down before they could escape. Thank you, everyone! At that moment, a delighted voice rang out over the chaos. Sing song and man. It looked so familiar, but I couldn't place it. Until a skeletal figure blurred across my vision, followed by splatters of blood. It was Lazarus, keeping his promise to protect me. Grabbing two guns from the ground, he stared to fire haphazardly. Thank you! <gasps> the vampires around him tried to dart away, but his bullets always found them. They collapsed one after another, screaming, tripping over themselves. Thank you! Thank you! Thank you! Thank you! His eyes were huge, bloodshot, full of obscene delight. Somehow he looked cruelly innocent, like a child crushing ants. Help! No! No matter how much they cried for mercy, his shots kept drilling into their skulls. Lazarus didn't seem to hear them, even as he grabbed fresh guns from their corpses. For a moment I had the bizarre sense that he wasn't here. He was stuck somewhere deep inside his own head. Wherever he was, I couldn't see it. And I had the feeling I wasn't supposed to. I was yanked back to the fight, carnage still rampaging around me in full force. Each time I blinked, I saw a different body falling down. More and more piling up on the ground in heaps of entrails, shattered bones, crushed organs. Dead friends, dead enemies, and corpses beyond recognition. But in death, all of them looked the same. The chaos seemed to stretch on and on and on. But at last, the screams died into whimpers. In reality, the fight had only lasted a few minutes, even though it seemed like forever. But because of her monstrous natures, the results were horrific. All around me, dead vampires covered the ground, headless, limbless, or with their hearts, hearts cut open. The stench of their blood permeated the air, belching out from their open wounds. Slowly, I realized that we'd won. There were more Golgotha still alive, some groaning and shuddering on the ground, others helping tend to the fallen. The Mavar and the Iskari had fled, leaving only their dead behind. But we'd lost many of our own too. All of these corpses would have to be taken away, and one by one, they'd become a tragedy to someone, not just a part of a faceless mass. Just as I finally stumbled up away from the sea of bodies, a human passed by the alleyway. He froze mid-stride, staring down at us, at the mangled bodies littering the concrete. The moment seemed surreal. I almost expected to jolt out of a dream, from anesthesia in a dentist's chair, to realize everything that had happened since that night at the club was one long, bizarre delusion, and I was back in the normal waking world. The man's eyes met my own. His pupils, like two TV screens switched off, held a blank look that had to be pure, Abject horror. Or say thought until he shrugged and continued on. At first I was stunned. It was like the horrible sight hadn't affected him at all. But after a moment I realized why the man hadn't shown any reaction. He must have thought he'd wandered past the move, he said. And somewhere there were eagerly rolling cameras, panning slowly across the bleeding corpses to capture every cinematic drop. Because after all, this was Hollywood. Hm. If you gave me a million years to ponder, I would have never guessed that true romance in Detroit would ever go together. A woman's soft, sultry voice echoed through the bedroom. I almost had the script memorized by now, as often as I'd heard these lines. 
But no matter how many times we sat here watching the opening of True Romance flash across the screen, you've always seemed to be enraptured by it. The light from the TV screen flickered over his pale features, reflecting in his eyes like a second square pupil. He hadn't noticed that I'd risen to my feet, or even that the doorbell had rung a few seconds ago. <sighs> Watch him silently. Images of a dim, grungy bar faded onto the TV. His eyes widened a little more, taking in the familiar scene with as much delight as if he'd never watched it before. Mm, Vince. Finally, he spoke my name, but his eyes didn't move from the screen. Don't leave, the opening is the best part. When they meet and laugh and instantly fall in love. You can't enjoy the rest of the movie if you miss it. I'd gotten used to this by now. We'd moved in together a few weeks ago, and I quickly learned his habits, the few that he had anyway. He was quiet, always attentive to my needs, clinging to my set whenever I was home. I could tell how desperately he wanted to please me, and how terrified he was of ever making me angry. In all this time, he'd never argued with me once. It seemed strange, but whenever I asked him about it, he replied that arguing was never worth it, when all he wanted was to make me happy. But there were a few things he stuck to. Unless someone forced him, he almost never went outside. Whenever he did, he seemed to fall into a depression that lasted several nights, and he only recovered once he'd hidden away from it for a time. And there was only one thing he ever really wanted to do with me, even if I tried to coax him into other activities or pastimes. Sit here and watch movies together. Always the same type of movie too, dramatic, romantic and unrealistic. He'd stare at the TV, completely hypnotized, reluctant to say a single word until the movie was over. Whenever I walked in, in on him alone, I'd almost always find him just like this, completely lost in the screen. Somehow, several months had already flown by. After the fight, Andre and I began sorting out the coven, following up on our plans. We drove out the rebel Mavar and Iskari who fled elsewhere with their leaders. Most of the neutral vampires were allowed to stay, although the Golgotha kept a watchful eye on them at all times. So far, there hadn't been any sign of a planned coup, though it seemed uncertain how long the peace could last. And Lazarus? After a climatic fight, he didn't try to contact me, and no one ever mentioned his name. Without a trace of his presence left behind, it was almost like he'd vanished altogether or met his fate trying to take revenge on Andre. As time went by, Andre honored his word, keeping me as his high-ranking assistant for as long as I desired. A relationship never really grew any closer, like he purposefully kept a distance from me, but he always seemed to listen to my opinions carefully. With a lay firmly under Andre's control, all of our resources were put towards furthering his plan. Nobody knew how long it would take before we could enact it. Years, decades, maybe even centuries more. But hope stayed high. Everyone clung to the idea of a world where we didn't have to hide in the dark, always pretending like we didn't exist. It was a dream, however distant, that kept the coven motivated and together. A dream Andre always encouraged to the fullest. In my mind though, I had to wonder if the uncertain timeline for Andre's future was what dragged him down. Back at the beginning, he always talked about what he'd do when he, we didn't need to hide anymore, and he could finally reclaim his old life. But over time, he seemed to bring up those distant dreams less and less, until he barely mentioned them at all. His soft voice mingled with the low hum from the TV, almost drowned out by it. Don't bother answering the door. Sit back here with me, please. Reach on one hand up towards me, fingers pleading outstretched, pleadingly outstretched. Alright, I'll stay here with you. 
Thank you. As I settled down beside him, he curled an arm snugly around my waist, leaning against me. It felt delicate and thin in my arms, like a tiny animal that needed me to protect it. We fell back into silence and the movie played on. Curious, I glanced down at Heath, wondering if the earlier interruption had pulled him from his trance at all. But his expression had gone almost completely blank again. Turned into only a reflection of the brightly flickering screen. Damn, that was such a cool ending! Like, everyone was telling me constantly how these endings are super underwhelming and sad. I mean, it was sad, of course, and like, people were so mad at the writers for the endings, but I love this ending! I think it was perfect! It was like, oh... I think it showed he, like, as a person, like his personality and his dreams and his failed dreams and his failed expectations so well. And then again, we were in the end together, so it wasn't that bitter. <sighs> I know he's not going to be happy, I know it's not going to be a very healthy relationship, it's a bit toxic as it is, but... But you know, no one ever said that it's going to be perfect, and I, I feel like it was a really good ending. Damn! I'm surprised, I was ready after all that people have told me. I was ready to be disappointed, to like, be really sad about what happened. I think it was actually fine. I'm so happy we, we get to that particular point, guys. I'm very, very happy about that. The music in this game was so good, so good. The artworks were nice. I had some little problems with some of the artworks. I don't think Randall, in his like alternative stances, looks that great. Um, but uh, the artworks mostly were were really cool. I love Heath's artwork. I really like uh, Andre, how he looked like. And but the music is just ah, so good. The backgrounds were awesome too. I really love them. I think there was a different artist for uh, backgrounds and for the characters. In general, I'm very happy with this game. Like, I don't know why this game has mixed opinions on Steam. I need to check out other endings, of course. But this is my ending. I want... Yes, I don't want any other ending. I feel very much satisfied with it. I think it's... It's fine. It's, of course, it's bitter, but... It's... It's sad. But it's how it was supposed to be, you know? Anyway... Guys, that was Red Embrace Hollywood, the full playthrough of the Hughes path. I am very happy with this. I don't know if I'm going to start the next path soon-ish. Let me know if you guys would want to see other paths of this game. But I'm so satisfied with what I got in here. I don't want to like, ruin it by, by getting anything else. But I think it was, it was a really good journey. I'm really happy I tried out this game and I played it with you guys. And... Uh, my next Let's Play is going to be Disco Elysium. It's a really interesting role-playing game. Very, very much heavily role-playing game. Not about vampires, but you will like it, I promise you guys. I played a little bit of it and I fell in love. And I decided you guys will love it as well. So this is what I'm going to do after Redemption is finished. And uh, yeah, damn. I'm happy about this. I hope you are happy too. Thank you so much, guys, and see you in another Let's Play. Don't get lost in the night. Bye.